Thank you very much indeed for asking me over. I apologize if I lose my voice slightly. Um, I'm going to speak for about 10 minutes or so just to explain why, as a profession, um, I do what I do, uh, which is basically, obviously, to pay the gas bill. Um, so not very romantic, but that is the origins of it all. And um, I need to explain that when I'm talking about we, I'm talking about our group. And there's 52 people in the expedition group. Um, most have been together with us for 39 years. Can you hear me at the back? Yeah. Um, obviously, over those years, quite a lot of them have died, so they're not with us anymore. But the ones that are, are still there. And I have to really say that the only thing that they've got in common on our group is that I've never paid any of them anything at any time. So there is no financial motivation whatsoever. If we do succeed on what we're doing, then um, that would be about 50% of the expeditions. The other 50% have failed. Uh, we include in failures when we break world records but don't actually get to the final goal. We divide what we do into two. Uh, one of them is not expeditions, it's just to raise money for chosen charities. And um, we do sort of the easier things, obviously, like um, Everest, which pretty much today everybody's grandmother goes up at the weekend. Um, but it, nonetheless, it is still easier than a jumble sale to re raise a reasonable amount. Um, the other thing that we go for has been um, any world record that nobody, not even the Norwegians, um, have managed to do. Um, and that's basically what we've gone for over all these years. I think um, it's important that if we do get there to the goal, that number one, we make a lot of noise about it for the media, because that is what your sponsor wants. And to us, the sponsor is God. And secondly, if you get there, you want to stick your flag there before anybody else puts their flag in the same place, especially the French. And I would say, if we have been any good at doing this over the years, it is probably due to the selection of the individual people on the team. And I used to keep that uh, to myself. And if I was looking at somebody maybe to take them on, I wouldn't give them one out of 10 on their characteristics or anything complex like that, I would just go for their motivation, their personal motivation. Because how somebody is motivated is how they behave for themselves and therefore for their expedition or their company or whatever. So before an interview, I obviously need a clear definition of motivation. And I don't know if you remember a famous Irish psychologist called Anthony Clare, BBC. Anyway, he was asked to define motivation in a single sentence. Uh, he obviously did not do that, because the Irish cannot define anything in a single <laughs> sentence. Um, but what he, what he did say was that motivation is something which happens to everybody when they are a teenager. They, they go to school, they meet a professor who they respect, who one day says something illuminating to them, which sticks in their head and forms the basis of their motivation through life thereafter, which is obviously a load of rubbish. In, in fact, how you are motivated is the sum total of everything which has happened to you personally since you were little and how you reacted to it. Or possibly even before you were little, it may be genetic. If you're born stupid, you'll probably stay stupid. If you go to school and you get badly bullied, this can have a big effect on how you interact socially for a long time, even if you don't know it. And I think this system of only selecting people on motivation normally works very well, except obviously there are exceptions to everything. And I've been in a hostile area with somebody for two months and thought they were good, and then discovered some flaw in their character which could be dangerous later on. And I have to say, in our group, if we notice something like that, what we do is to sack them instantly. None of this sort of British sideways promotional pussyfooting, which uh, just keeps your rotten apple in the barrel. Uh, you, you might think, if you're cynical, and I have to say you look quite a cynical lot, um, you might think it's, it's all very well for someone like me to talk about sacking people, whereas in the real world, of course, you can't. In the UK, there's something called the Industrial Relations Act, which is designed to stop you sacking people that ought to be sacked. We 
in Antarctica have a much worse problem is you can sack them, but you can't get rid of them. <laughs> um, this basically means obviously that you've got to have a good selection process up front, in fact, pretty water type. And I think in terms of my own motivation for doing this sort of thing, probably goes way back to when I was one in uh, Windsor, where I got born, outside the castle, obviously, <laughs> at a time when it was being bombed during the war, which my mother did not like. So she moved all of my sisters and me aged one out to South Africa for 12 years without consulting us. And I have to say, it was a very nice place to get brought up, except that academically, it was way behind the UK. So when we all got back, my mother didn't have any money, she was looking for somewhere to educate us, and was very happy when she found a place called Winchester College, which took anybody totally free of charge, if your family name was Fines. This was basically because the bloke that built the college 800 years ago had been called Fines, and liked the idea of lots of little finesses going there free. <laughs> um, also because in those days there were very few of us, so it was economically safe for the college. But more recently we started to breed like rabbits, um, mostly actors, and it became unsafe for the college. So they changed the rules and after that you could only get in free if you got the top level of entrance exam. And due to my African background, I got the bottom level, and they would not accept me, to my mother's disappointment. In fact, the only place which would take people with such a low level of intellect was, of course, Eton College. <laughs> so I went there for about five years, but my level was so low that I couldn't even keep up with theirs. But uh, luckily, there was uh, boxing, which did not require too much intelligence, and also, of course, uh, stegophily. <laughs> Stegophilus is basically if you get born with an edifice complex, meaning you like to climb tall edifices at night in order to put things on top to annoy the school authorities. <laughs> and over those five years at Eton, I learned, I think in the 1960s, British architects stopped using proper steel drain pipes outside buildings and switched to plastic ones, which very often break when you get up to the sixth floor. So from an academic viewpoint, therefore, Eton was not a total waste of time. But going back to motivation, my mother realized that if I stayed there, I wouldn't be able to do the only thing that I wanted to do since I was little, which was to become the commanding officer of the Royal Scots Greys Cavalry Regiment, which my dad uh, had been commanding when he was killed in the war. And on his day, this regiment had 600 grey horses, quite romantic, and also, in order to get to be a British officer, you did not require A-levels. But by the time I arrived on the scene, the regiment had switched from horses to tanks, even though it was the British Army, and also you couldn't get to Sandhurst if you did not have your A-levels. So my mother removed me from Eton, because she knew if I stayed there, I would not get them. The place is badly designed for getting people A-levels. And I was sent to a famous place in Brighton called Davis's. And if you went there, when you came out the other end, you definitely had your A-levels. And I'm not at all proud of having broken their record. Um, <laughs> this, this was not my fault, because at that time was the height of the uh, mini-skirt era, <laughs> and um, concentration was not therefore possible. So I failed the A-levels twice. But basically, I'm sure you're aware, if you cannot get where you want, like Sandhurst, you've got to find an alternate route. And I found a place in Aldershot called Mons Cadet School. And if you went there for about five months and you could prove to the sergeants that under a situation of great stress, you could still dig holes in straight lines, you could become an officer in the British Army. So I did this and I got sent out to Germany. It was the Cold War at that time. And I spent the next five years in tanks learning how to retreat from the German border. <laughs> Did not practice advancing, which got pretty tedious. So when I saw a notice on the regimental board asking for officers to apply for the SAS, I put my name down, not because I knew anything about the SAS. In those days, nobody had ever heard of them. It was before Harold Wilson started to use them for PR purposes. <laughs> I had obviously heard of Scandinavian Airlines services, <laughs> but um, 
not the regiment. So I got sent to Hereford, which is where you go to get selected for the unit. And I found there were 180 soldiers trying to get in, 30 other officers. All of them were built like brick houses. Many of them had uh, red berries, ex paras None of them came from a cavalry regiment. They called me a donkey walloper. So, to be honest, I was quite happy when this lot got ruthlessly eliminated in only 10 days, down to only three soldiers and two officers. And to my surprise, I was still there. I think probably because they were selecting people from a physical, not intelligence point of view. But unfortunately, on the 11th day, they switched. And I had to try to become alert. And I can remember, if you failed anything, you got thrown out immediately. And what me and the other remaining officer were having to do one particular night was to cross the local river by night in winter with no clothes on for some military reason. So I woke up extremely knackered the following morning at about 11 o'clock. It meant to get up at 6 o'clock, and I panicked because they leave your instructions every day on your bed. And what it was that particular day was to steal £200,000 from the local bank in Hereford in great detail, which the SAS check after. I had Barclays, the other officer had Lloyd's. So I rushed down to the bank, but it was already closed, so I could not get in to do a careful burglary plan. So I went around the back of the bank, and I banged on the back window, and luckily the manager came out, charming bloke, very naive, and <laughs> I, I explained that I had come from Germany, I was trying to get into the SAS, I brought all my family silver with me. This bit was not true. And he said, no problem, we at Barclays are extremely secure. He showed me all the electronic burglar system, so I thanked him. And in those days, carbon paper, I copied the bank raid plan in great detail, one copy to the SAS, just in time, and me and the other bloke had the day off. So we went up to Birmingham, we saw a film and had a spaghetti dinner. And very stupidly after dinner, I left my copy of the bank raid plan in the restaurant. And the manager, later in court, uh, what happened, <laughs> gave the plans to the police. There was a ministerial inquiry in Westminster, front page of the Times, why SAS officers were stealing from banks. I was up before the colonel of the regiment who, who basically said any more behaviour like that and I would be thrown out of the regiment immediately. Well, for the next year or so, in odd parts of the world, doing odd things with the regiment, I behaved pretty well. But briefly back in the UK, unfortunately, I got phoned by an old Eton friend who, by that time, like most of them, had become a wine salesman in the West Country. <laughs> and during the course of selling his stuff in pubs down there, he discovered a village called Castle Coombe, which had just been voted Europe's prettiest village by the Americans. And it was being attacked by 20th Century Fox making a film in this beautiful village called uh, Dr. Doolittle which involved building this beautiful trout stream, thatched cottages into a dirty great lake with a 20-foot high concrete dam, ruining the village. And my friend decided to bring this outrage to the general attention by blowing up the entire concrete dam the night before the film started. A good PR plan. Unfortunately, the police got to hear about it. They put Alsatian dogs all over the dam. But uh, my friend had been at Eton, so he was up to that one. What he did was to rent eight Alsatian bitches uh, in order to put them upwind of the dam. But at the last minute, the bitches failed to turn up, so he phoned me to ask if I would stand in. Um, because I had just completed an army explosives course where you learn to blow up as much as you can using as little as possible. And I was pretty good at this, so I had a lot left over at the end of every day. And it seemed stupid to give it back to Her Majesty, so I put it in the boot. And two months later, the boot was full and sweating. And what better way of getting rid of it than this public-spirited gesture? Unfortunately, everybody was caught. Um, I was not physically caught. I'd been doing another army course on escaping from dogs by night. But they had the car numbers. I ended up in Chippenham Prison. I was on police probation for six months. I was thrown out of the SAS back to my own regiment, who were still retreating from the German border. <laughs> but I put up with that for about another year, and then I saw a notice on the regimental board asking for officers to apply for SAF. 
Uh, that is the, the Sultan of Oman's forces. You probably don't remember, but back then world Marxism was doing very well. They just chucked the Brits out of the Yemen and were about to move into the Oman in order to block 80% of the free world's oil coming out of the Gulf. Therefore, the socialist prime minister here agreed to send the Sultan a massive show of military strength, uh, which he did. There were about nine of us at that time. <laughs> and I can remember applying for this job from the colonel, but all the other applicants were coming out looking gloomy because they had been turned down due to being too valuable to the regiment. But uh, my application went through immediately. <laughs> and what the Ministry of Defence think is you cannot command Arabs in the dark being shot at by communists if you can't speak Arabic. <laughs> so first of all, you get sent to the best place in the world for learning Arabic, according to the ministry, which is Beaconsfield in North London. <laughs> um, I did fail the course, but I was still sent out. And on arrival, you meet your, shall we say, works team for the first time. And I have to say they were a piratical looking group. There were 60 of them. Most of them, I discovered, were in fact um, Baluchi, so they could only speak Urdu. Many of them were Zanzibaris, who spoke only Swahili, and the few that did speak Arabic had not been to Beaconsfield. So we <laughs> ended with a major communications problem. But I think going back to motivation, it was probably out there that I began to get a... Okay. Um, that is the navy of the Sultan of Oman, <laughs> the army. Um, this is my reconnaissance platoon, normally very well disciplined, but on this occasion we're about to attack Rakhut, held by communist machine guns, so they were apprehensive and seasick. Um, this is one half of the Sultan's air force, photographed obviously from the other half. Um, if you look carefully, typical Omani, Zanzibari, Baluchi, myself, European, all of us were, of course, uh, Muslim. I was Muslim for the three years we were out there. Um, although you may think that Arabia looks just like that sand, which is completely true, apart from one area the size of Wales, um, which is where the war was going on at that time. Because of a monsoon, three months a year, rain, you get this little area, uh, which is not like that at all. It's got forest and rivers and so on, and that was where the war was going on. We were outnumbered. There were 180 of us, all volunteers in the Sultan's army. The opposition, the People's Front, had been very well trained in Odessa, in the Soviet Union, very well armed. There were 4,000 of them, so we were heavily outnumbered. So I quickly realized the best thing to do was to change from the six Land Rovers of the Recce platoon and train them, which they didn't like initially, to move only in groups of four with walkie-talkie contact and only to move by night, never by day, and uh, two machine guns per group. That way, however much you are outnumbered, you can still survive perfectly well. There were no helicopters at that time. You got someone badly wounded out in the forest. Best thing was you could sort of shoot them because they were going to have a very bad time otherwise. Moving around um, in this area is not good because there are more snakes here than anywhere else in the world. If you get bitten by an echis carpet viper, you will be brain dead within two seconds. We have the PM, which is even quicker. That is a Soviet anti-personnel mine. <laughs> Very often on the border with the Yemen, you're sitting in caves waiting for the Idarat political execution squads to come across the border and do very nasty things to the Muslim chiefs to change them into Marxists. We were there to kill them before they could cross the border and do these things. But very often, we'd be sitting in a cave for five or six days, which is all the water you can carry, and nothing would happen. Three years later, I got a bit bored with this, I went to the uh, British Museum Natural History Department. They didn't pay me, but they taught me how to measure and accurately and photograph new insects because no botanist had ever been into this country before and there were new, literally, types of insect. Uh, if you go today to the Natural History Museum and to the scorpion department, uh, there is an 18-inch black scorpion of a new variety with my name attached in Latin. I'm very proud of it. I stroke it when I go there. Um, 
Also, you get chameleons growing up to two feet long. You may know if, if you put them on a green leaf, they go green, but if you put them on a red flower, they will actually turn red. Uh, people say if you put them on a tartan blanket, they will explode. <laughs> The, the people, uh, we had to recognize uh, 16 tribes like the Bauta Khauri, the Mahra, the Shakra, the Beit Katheri, and so on. This lot, the Eastern Mahra, were descended from the Queen of Sheba. As you know, she ruled uh, in Ethiopia at the time King Solomon was king up in the north of Arabia, uh, in Jerusalem. And um, she attacked South Oman because it is and was the only country in the world where frankincense <laughs> trees grow. You might say, well, so what? It costs much more than gold or silver incense during the Roman Empire, a good place to colonize. But by the time I got there, incense had lost its value and the people were very, very poor. If you compare, this is a family, I knew them very well, of 15 human beings lived in that house of three rooms. Imagine it's your entire life, that's all you own. Um, kitchen, sitting room for 15 people, garage on the left, and that is it. They depend very, very often on their camel's milk. So when it runs out of grass, you put your house on your camel's back and move off to find grass. Not much of a life. If you're lucky when you're 12, you might marry someone slightly better off. We tried to protect them, but we were heavily outnumbered, didn't do very well. Also, we had a huge area to patrol. We only had six vehicles. We patrolled the entire Saudi, Omani, Yemeni border. You never wanted to go too many times on the same tracks. They would lay anti-tank mines, which would blow a land rover 100 meters, and the people quite a lot further than that. I began uh, at that time to search for a lost city of incense from which the incense had been exported right through 900 miles of waterless desert up to Jerusalem. Now, I knew that it existed because um, Marco Polo mentioned it. Ptolemy, who made the first map of the world, had it written down on it somewhere in the desert. I had to leave the Sultan's army, not because I wanted to, but because I was posted from the British army, and they threw me out because I hadn't been to Sandhurst, hadn't got a regular commission, and eight years was your absolute maximum lot at that time. So I find myself back in the UK with no job. I got married at the time. She had no money either. And basically, the only thing which I could do was to start trying to use my military experience in Germany, which had been in the Cold War, teaching Scottish soldiers how to canoe and climb and ski in order to stop them beating each other up in the naffy, which they were increasingly doing because they were bored stiff because the Soviet army never bothered to attack. Now, that activity was called adventure training and it was paid for by the taxpayer. But now, doing it with my wife, of course, no tax paying. Uh, you had to use sponsorship then and now today. Well, in the early days, back in 67, we started to search for the lost city as civilians. Over 26 years, I did eight major expeditions to find that lost city, which we did eventually find in 1992. In the early days, Ginny and I, obviously nobody had ever heard of us, to try and get a sponsor was extremely difficult. Just to give you an idea of the first two expeditions we did back in the late 60s, uh, the first one, Ginny decided that we would do the first ever complete journey up the longest river in the world, which is the Nile at 4,000 miles long. She decided to use hover hawks, two-seater hovercraft, because at that time in the Guinness Book of Records, they had the world record of hovering without a breakdown for eight hours around a gravel pit in Peterborough. So obviously the right model for the Nile. They had three motorbike engines which could lift them two centimeters above the surface. We took uh, eight months because there were a lot of sort of four centimeter obstacles. <laughs> I'll give you an idea of the a difference of the expeditions. Uh, a year later, we got asked by Vancouver, the capital of British Columbia, to do part of their centenary celebrations. They'd been a province of Canada 100 years. All the people who, ex who explored and discovered British Columbia, which is bigger than the three Great Britons, but almost entirely forest and the Rocky Mountains. 
Um, they, the early explorers had all been Scottish, they'd all travelled by river, that's why they're still called the Fraser and the Thompson and the Mackenzie and so on. And they had used rivers all the way down north-south, but they'd never done a single journey 2,000 miles down the roughest rivers in the world, which interlock. And we were asked, or rather Edinburgh High Command was asked, to send a Scottish group to do that as part of the centenary year. I was asked to lead the expedition because by then I was on the Army Reserve and I was told that I would be given a support Land Rover, BER. Well, I later discovered that meant beyond economical repair. <laughs> they also said if I went to Edinburgh, I could select out of 600 soldiers the best three. When I got there, I discovered they'd all been posted and only the cooks were there, so I had to choose from them. I found a very fine Scotsman called um, Joseph Skabinski and the three of them were given a total of six weeks annual leave. We took uh, nine and a half months, so they were not popular when they got back. Um, now, one reason for this was that none of us had ever been on rough water before, um, and yet the ministry only gave us training permission on the Thames at Henley. So when we got to Canada, our learning curve was very steep. The rock causes a hydraulic, that's an 18-foot boat, that's a 22-foot hydraulic, in Hell's Gate, and we had four boats with three people in each boat. At Hell's Gate, one was flipped. We found their bodies a mile downstream, which could have stopped the entire expedition, but uh, luckily it was just the BBC film crew. <laughs> Not the Northern Irish BBC film crew. <laughs> um, I'm afraid you're going to have to look at this quite carefully. Um, that is uh, Belfast over there. That's the Greenwich Meridian, zero, and then 180. Well, around about 1970, I was having breakfast with my wife, my late wife, Ginny, one morning, and we discovered that because sponsors depend on media coverage, and media coverage has a fashion, and in New York, the fashion starts changing before it comes here, and at that time, the media were no longer interested in hot expeditions. They only wanted cold polar Shackletonian expeditions. So we would have to go cold. We had by then spent an entire winter in Glasgow, but that was not <laughs> enough. We, Ginny decided that what we must do is go into this new field ambitiously by doing the first ever journey around Earth, 53,000 miles as the crow flies, and we would have to um, find out the best route. So she sent me to a library, and I quickly discovered that uh, there was a white bit at the bottom called Antarctica, which uh, no human had ever crossed from side to side in a single expedition, including the world's experts. If we went up the other side, there was another problem, two and a half thousand miles of floating ice, also not crossed from edge to edge before. So I went home, as you would, and I told my wife it was a stupid idea. Uh, she became quite unpleasant, so I therefore uh, went back to the library. But basically, you, if you want a sponsorship, you have got to be first, not second. And we knew we were in a hurry because the great American polar man, Walt Pedersen, was desperate at that time to be the first human to both poles by surface travel. He didn't want to go the whole way around like Jenny did, but nonetheless. We tried hard to rush, but if you've got no money, it takes time. We worked unpaid every day, every week, every month for seven years to get this project going. We got people like yourselves who'd be prepared to do four years of work without any pay. And um, we got the team together gradually. We needed sponsors. We needed 1,900 sponsors. Uh, it took a long time to get. We had no telephone because the SAS gave us a um, derelict rifle range in Sloan Square uh, in London as an office because they'd forgotten about my problems earlier on. And uh, they did not put a telephone in it. And if you want sponsors, you do need a telephone. So one night we found a territorial soldier who was a GPO technician and we put him out of the window onto the MOD roof and he clipped us into the MOD phone system and they sponsored us for seven years with a free phone. <laughs> um, we needed um, 
two other people because Ginny's rule was that we would never fly one meter of the 52,000 miles, but we did need an aircraft for dropping parachutes and stuff, and that took six years to get hold of. We needed two people who would be with me going without flying all the way around, but I had 800 applicants, and out of 800 applicants, we only wanted the two. Neither of the ones we selected had ever been on an expedition. One of them, Ollie Shepherd, who'd been a beer salesman in London for Whitbread for nine years. The other one, Charlie Burton, who's dead now, sadly, uh, had been a butcher in Cape Town and then joined the British Army as a soldier. But their characters were correct. You can't change characters, you can teach skills. We eventually reached um, Antarctica, where the Greenwich Meridian hits the coast. Our ship, with people, like I said earlier on, from nine different countries, given up their jobs, P&O, chief engineer or whatever, they dropped us off. But when you're unloading there, uh, it can be a problem because the ice can break up if the wind gets up. But we did unload 6,000 boxes, none of which weighed more than 60 pounds, which is what a person can carry in soft snow. The ship said goodbye. We will see them again in 18 months' time on the other side of the world, the Pacific. They would wait in New Zealand for 18 months, and then hopefully we would send a message, obviously Morse code in those days, saying that we had arrived and could they come in and collect us and take us up the rest of the uh, Jenny's plan. Well, the ship went off, and we, in what remained of the summer, tried to go inland. Um, there was a South African summer base for three months every year on the edge. Two geologists uh, went 12 miles in to look for rocks, uh, fell into a crevasse and were killed, but we managed to go, the three of us, 400 miles to the very edge of the Great Polar Plateau uh, to a rock. If you look carefully, you can see one there. That's actually a mountain on the horizon there. From that point, for 900 miles to the South Pole, no human being knew what was there. It was unmapped, um, no satellites, and it was totally unknown for that entire distance. We would be mapping it, trained in Cambridge to use aneroid barometers for an area bigger than France. It was the last time of any terrestrial mapping before satellites in 1994 uh, covered the area. But before we could set out, we had to live in the dark, cold period. Um, and we Ginny designed in Wales cardboard houses light enough to be parachuted ahead of us. When we got there, we put them up. They could withstand minus 30 centigrade. That winter, and we were working for the WMO, uh, sending reports about the weather, weather and uh, we recorded minus 122 degrees centigrade, that's the wind chill factor, and um, so you might think we got quite cold in the huts. They were designed to cover against 40 mile an hour winds, we recorded 160 miles an hour, so you might think we got blown over. But actually, they were designed so that snow would come up to that level, giving you insulation and protection. But then, of course, you could not get out. Uh, you might think, well, why would you want to get out? And the answer is basically that we were cooking in petrol in a cardboard house. <laughs> Ginny, my late wife, uh, became probably the best polar radio operator in Europe. Um, her frequency prediction was incredible. Antenna theory, better than Marconi, and uh, kept us in contact with um, our base in Farnborough, even when the British Antarctic Survey could not make contact with Cambridge. Uh, no GPS, no sat phone, um, nothing like that. We were using Morse code and compass. We had crevasses, of course. There are now, we know, 15,000 crevasses typically on a traverse of Antarctica, but you cannot see them because in winter the snow blows over them and to find out where they are you need to tread onto them and fall into them and then you know where they were. Um, we practiced on one that had already collapsed just outside our base camp. Eight months later the sun came back, the thermometer rose to minus 68 centigrade and we decided to say goodbye and leave for the 900 miles of unknown. Didn't even know how high it would be above sea level. It turned out to be 11 and 12,000 feet high. We said goodbye to the base commander, radio operator. That is the nastiest job of all. That's why I gave it to Ginny, because the whole thing had been her fault for thinking of it. Unfortunately, she was a small person and could not roll 45 gallon drums of fuel about. So a man had to be living with my wife for three years. I did not want somebody physically attractive in that position. 
Uh, luckily, we found a Yorkshireman for that particular job. <laughs> we did manage to cross the unexplored zone and mapped it. Our tent weighed 120 pounds. Today, our tent weighs three pounds, but up there you get catabatic winds which go from zero to 100 miles an hour in under a minute, which doesn't give you long to put your tent pegs in. That's why we used the best tent ever designed. Aerodynamically, it digs itself in the stronger the wind. It was designed in 1902 by the world's greatest polar explorer of all time. His expeditions, including when he died down there, produced more scientific information about Antarctica than all the other international expeditions of the first half of the 20th century, including discovering that it was a continent. I'm talking about Captain Scott. We did eventually reach the far side of Antarctica. You know when you've got to the Pacific because there is only one active volcano in the entire continent. Two days before we got there, the world's first tourist to Antarctica arrived in a DC-10, crashed into the volcano, everybody was killed, no way of removing their bodies. But from here, we could see the Pacific. Uh, just very quickly, otherwise you won't understand what follows. Ginny drew the route that we would take nine and a half years earlier in London on her school six-inch globe with crayon. She decided that if we got out here, uh, that sea ice, you may see in the, picture, in the um, Times last month that the Russian and Chinese icebreakers were stuck in here. Well, the year that we send a message, Morse code, come and get us, they came down. Uh, everybody's still unpaid. Two of them were dead, but everyone else was okay. Two ships sunk. Ours got through, took us up. Australia, Vancouver, Los Angeles, the other way around. And through the Bering Straits, that's the Soviet Union, that's Alaska. That is the Greenwich Meridian going up there, this, the Arctic Sea. Somewhere 500 miles north of land is the place called the North Pole. You might think that the easiest thing would be, quite simply, to get our ship, which is ice strengthened, in here, up to the North Pole and over back to Greenland and Greenwich. But if our ship went in there at all, you got three million ton ice flows floating around at four miles an hour, and when two of them hit each other, your ship will actually sink. Therefore, when she made the plan, nine and a half years earlier, she decided that the ship would drop the land group off there. That's the mouth of the Yukon River. We would then go 1,200 miles up the Yukon in 12-foot rubber boats, three of us. We would then go north down the Mackenzie River, 800 miles. We would switch to an open 15-foot plastic boat and go 2,000 miles through the North West Passage. And then, which hadn't been done before, another 900 miles up to that northern island there, uninhabited, called Ellesmere Island, where we would wait for eight months of darkness before doing the difficult bit, which is the two and a half thousand miles over the top. Her plan gave us a total of two months to get from the mouth of the Yukon to that island. When we got there, we discovered that only three expeditions in history had ever been through this bit, the Northwest Passage, and they'd taken an average of three years to get through. I am obviously not making any comment on female planning, but they do need to be watched. <laughs> we had uh, no problem on the Yukon River, except that uh, Ollie Shepard, the beer salesman, after nine years unpaid on this project, had been threatened with divorce and had had to leave. So the two of us carried on. When we got to the Northwest Passage, if you can picture that black line at the bottom as being on the map, the Canadian coast, 500 miles up there is the North Pole. All the ice flows are being sent in summer against the Canadian coast by the current. And very often you can't get through, even in mid-summer. Uh, we were lucky. There was a dirty great storm from the south which blew the ice sufficiently away from the cliffs to sneak through the 2,000 miles. And then where you turn north, which I showed you on the map, to get to the islands, at that point, the sea began to freeze. That's called grease ice. Two hours of no wind, it will become sugar porridge ice, at which point the propellers will cavitate and the boat will freeze in, which is what happened. We did later discover that the, it unfroze nine years later and the Canadian icebreaker managed to retrieve the boat, but we didn't know that at the time. From here, the two of us had to ski 400 miles over unmapped mountains to get to the edge of the most northerly island in the world. 
Uh, the other bloke, Charlie Burton, the South African, uh, that's him over on the left there, unfortunately his skis broke on the second day, which was extremely irritating, which I told him. Uh, not a good idea, because mine broke soon after. We used snowshoes. One of the soles of his feet fell off, leaving raw nerves under the foot. Uh, his language got even worse than normal. He then developed hemorrhoids, and it got worse. Then one day, he fell over, and he cracked his head on a rock, and his eyes filled up with blood, and he started to whinge. He basically <laughs> suggested that we ought to rest for a couple of days. If we had rested at that point, we had the wrong clothing, no resupply potential, the dark, cold bit coming, uh, we would have not only failed, but let down the other 50 people who'd spent nine years unpaid on this project. The team is absolutely vital that each bit does its bit. He did keep going. I got a picture of his better foot. Um, we eventually got to the base camp. Ginny and the two of us lived for eight months there. And then we said goodbye to Ginny. The two of us left her in the dark to try and do the last two and a half thousand miles. About a week after we left, she looked out of the living hut at the stores hut where all our parachutes were stored for the eight-month attempt to do the crossing. Uh, it had caught fire. She tried to put it out, did a bad job. <laughs> Sent a message. We were by then 200 miles away in the dark. All the pictures I took, uh, this is on the way to the pole, that steam from open water, even though it's minus 50, all the pictures I took for the first month in the darkness came out black, so there's no point showing them to you. But uh, imagine that that was in the dark, that's what you're struggling over. Um, we then eventually, in a very bad way, got to the pole, became the first human beings in history to reach both poles. We put a flag there, because people do, but it's pretty stupid, because within one hour the flag would be half a mile away from the pole, because the ice is floating. If you go there and you want to put your flag there, uh, drill a hole in the ice, swim down 18,000 feet to the seabed, <laughs> put your flag there and it will stay put. Um, we did not do that. Um, at that point, we knew that we wanted to go to Greenwich, which is due south on the compass. Unfortunately, so was every other potential destination in the entire world. And this caused a bad argument between the two of us at that point. We wanted to go 2,100 miles from the pole to get to where the ship might rescue us. Uh, we only got 450 miles before the breakup. Um, let me explain very briefly. In summertime, ultraviolet weakens the sea ice. People go there nowadays to the North Pole. They'll be removed by helicopter before the breakup. Um, when the ice breaks up, remember that ice grows on the sea at three feet a year. So old multi-year ice is deeper where the current is stronger, and those multi-year ice flows will ram through hundreds of miles of weaker ice where you are camped. You can hear the roar approaching from 100 miles away from a storm like a tsunami of breaking ice. Not good. We were out there for eight months on the breaking ice. Not good for your imagination. You can't sleep because you know the next crack might be underneath the tent. We have to keep moving it. Um, you don't want people with too much imagination. This is why we have ex-military people. Um, you, in the tent, we never got bored shifting it as time went by. We realized it was too unsafe to travel, so we hoped our ice flow would float for 1,800 miles down, not towards the Soviet Union, but towards Greenland. We never got bored because Charlie had a solar panel which gave us enough power to listen to the BBC World Service for two minutes a day if there was reception. And I can remember one particular day, Charlie, with his headsets on, said, the United Kingdom is at war. So I said, who with? He said, oh, I didn't get that bit. <laughs> we, we sat for five days of bad radio reception, arguing who the hell it could be. I mean, obviously, we knew that Mrs. Thatcher was aggressive, but we couldn't work out who with. Um, of course, we assumed it was France, but we had no proof. Um, when they said it was um, Argentina, we thought that was just a stupid BBC joke. We also did not get bored because we got visited. Never knew when the next one would arrive. They weigh one and a half tons. Um, up there, a long way from where they kill, they will actually go for you. The Canadian government had told us that actually only 10% of bears eat humans. 
but you can't ask them which percent. <laughs> We were not so much worried by the bears as by the fact that the remnants of our ice flow was disintegrating as we headed south. We sent a Morse code message to Southampton for the ship to come two months earlier than was actually planned by Jenny. They did try and they hulled, they hulled the hull in winter ice and started to sink. Cleverly, they rammed ice so that the hull was above the ice and oxyacetylene, the Scottish engineers, repaired it temporarily. They went back to Spitsbergen for two months and we were really panicking um, as we headed south. Um, we had canoes with skis made five years earlier in case this happened, very light, but as it did happen, we never dared get in them because we were too weak and the ice could move at four miles an hour and would get crushed if you couldn't leap out very quickly. We eventually reached the ship. I don't know if you can see us just down there. When, after eight months on the moving ice, we got onto the ship, humans, for the first and last time in history, had been around Earth's vertical surface. More people have been on the moon. We got back to Greenwich within two days of the date planned by Jenny 10 years previously and kept our team together. And for the next, the 80s and the 90s, we broke all records, unsupported polar travel north and south against the Norwegians and Canadians and others. We used British aerospace technology to go over very thin ice rather than be delayed. If you travelled over that stuff, you'd fall through and it would go over your head at four miles an hour. We had an amphibious system with no heavy gear apart from a couple of paddles. We used skis to tie the skis, the boats together, sledges rather. And then political. 1992, Gorbachev announced perestroika, so I wrote a letter, Dear Mr. Gorbachev, can I lead the first Western expedition from Siberia? If you look carefully at that white thing there, that is the North Pole. Siberia is 500 miles south, and there is one place where, as the ice rushes by the coast, it jams against Cape Artichiski, and if you're quick, you can get across onto more solid ice to the north. Well, it was also, Artichiski, a secret Soviet missile base, so I had to sign a contract that while there I would take no photographs. Um, I did not, the other members of the team did. <laughs> um, we broke all existing world records and when we got back to London, I discovered to my irritation, I have to admit, that not the Norwegians this time, but the Americans. NASA in Pasadena, California, is called the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. They put cameras on the shuttle, they fly up to 170 kilometers in space, and they take photographs. That is a NASA photograph, that's a NASA professor. If you look through NASA bioptics at this map, it's 80 miles between each sand dune area. This is the empty quarter. Saudi Arabia is up here, the north, down there is the Indian Ocean. They were looking for my lost city. Now, by then, I'd been looking for it for 25 years, and I was about to find it, so I didn't want NASA getting in on the act. They knew that it was out there because, even though it was 10 metres under the surface at that point, they could actually see it through these bioptics. It's called um, cheating. <laughs> and they, they also knew it was a... A lost city because it was all right angles and only humans make things with right angles so it's got to be a lost city. Well our group managed, uh, Land Rover very quickly sponsored us with five special vehicles. We went right out to the NASA grid reference of the lost city, it's called the L site. Uh, I'm not going to tell you how we found out what their grid reference was, it wasn't WikiLeaks but we <laughs> did find out. We got out there before they could mount their own expedition and um, my archaeologist, the best in the world, Dr. Zarins, took one look at the NASA site and he said, this is actually not the lost city. This is a place made by uh, God using right angles in order to fool NASA. <laughs> um, we reverted to traditional archaeology and starting with an outpost, we found the lost city uh, on the 23rd of November by sheer good luck, nothing to do with NASA. Uh, but we deserved it after 26 years on and off looking for it. Frustrating for me because the place that we found it was only half a mile away from the place that I'd always used as my base camp to, from which to go hundreds of miles to look for the... <laughs> um, just to uh, end up with, I'm going to miss out a lot of expeditions. Uh, this picture was drawn by Shackleton round about 1906. People thought that that's what Antarctica looked like. Um, as we just heard, he, his plan 
was that his ship, the Endurance, would go from South America, drop him and his group off, they would walk to the South Pole, amazing journey. If they got there, they knew they would die of hunger because can't carry enough. Therefore, the other half of Shackleton's expedition, they from Australia came around the other side and their plan was to drop food off. Well, as you know, his ship uh, sunk, so he never did set out and couldn't tell these guys that he hadn't set out, so they did. Uh, three of them were killed, so they didn't drop the food off properly, so if he had got there, he would have died anyway, but it was a good plan. It was copied in the 1950s as a pincer plan, two separate expeditions. One was led by Dr. Fuchs from the UK, the top polar man in Europe, and the other half, paid for by the New Zealand government, led by Ed Hillary, who'd previously first man up Everest. They used these vehicles as a typical uh, crevasse. But I'm talking about the 1990s, which is when we um, heard what the Norwegians were up to. But let me just explain, only four people had ever crossed Antarctica. Uh, that was the blue line there was my wife's Transglobe expedition, which I talked about. There was the uh, red line in 1990, the American expedition. The diagonal was Hillary and Fuchs. And lastly, the yellow one, the first manhole crossing by Reinhold Messner, the great climber from Italy, and Arved Fuchs, Germany's top polar man. But all of us used air support. Now we're talking in the 90s. What happened was, in the UK, our group heard that the Norwegians were about to try to do the first unsupported crossing of the continent. 20 years we'd looked at that one and it was just calorifically impossible, you can't carry enough. But if your main rivals are about to do it, you can't give them a clear start. So we stopped what we were planning, switched very quickly, we caught an aeroplane to get to Antarctica's only big airport, that's the control tower. We switched, uh, we switched aircraft, we flew 1,200 miles to the start point, which is where the Atlantic hits Antarctica. About 100 miles away on the edge, the Norwegians set out on the same day. Our team consisted of myself and Dr. Michael Stroud, who is Europe's top physiologist, specializes in studying the effects of starvation on the human body. And when you run out of body fat, what happens in the uh, muscle cannibalization process? The greatest advances in discovering about that had been at Auschwitz, but not much had happened since. You need to be able to pay soldiers to suffer incredibly, and uh, they don't when you get to a certain extent on a treadmill. They just won't carry it on even for money. So Mike was therefore delighted to get an opportunity for extreme stress and starvation. So it's in his element on this expedition. The aircraft dropped us off and said, see you again in 1800 miles. We had to carry enough food and fuel for that, and it weighed 500 pounds each. He monitored our output daily, which was 8,500 calories average, sometimes 11,000 calories, more than had ever been recorded scientifically before, including on the Tour de France, and uh, we could only carry 5,000, so we were officially starving. Even Weight Watchers would not recommend it. You can't wear Gore-Tex or polar fleece. Towing that weight, you're sweating while you're moving. You'd get hypothermia, you have no spare clothing. You cannot wear soft muckluck boots like normal to protect your feet because you just won't move forward with that weight. You have to have plastic downhill rigid boots that dig the skins in so you can pull forward and that hurts your toes. That's after 10 days, quite painful for an hour. Then they get cold and stop hurting. Uh, gangrene, three weeks later, we knew that we would have skin grafts by the end of the three months. Uh, Sydney, ozone hole, skin cancer. Much worse here, you're under the hole, you cannot, you must cover your skin up. But remember, you are towing 500 pounds on a dog harness round your ribs, you breathe like hell at every step, you can't cover up your lips, so they get scabby from the sun very quickly. In the tent at night, when you sleep, your lips close. When you wake up in the morning, you must say good morning to the other bloke. It's called team dynamics. But uh, you can't until you pull your lips apart because uh, they're scabbed. And uh, the first thing you do in the morning is to share porridge out of a communal bowl. So all your blood goes in his porridge, which causes bad relations. <laughs> Crevasse, this, um, you don't need to be very clever to know the time on that man's watch. The sun is due north at midday and he's treading on his shadow and he wants to go south. 
So that is it. An hour later, I'm going to say, right, there is my shadow. The sun moves 15 degrees an hour, so 15 degrees at 2 o'clock, 30 degrees. And that was the most sophisticated method of navigating 1,800 miles with no features until 94, when satellites and GPS first arrived. Crevasses, I took a photograph of that because you could actually see that crevasse. Mostly you cannot see them, as I said, till you've fallen into them. So I developed a very careful policy which is to watch the bloke ahead. <laughs> Nobody is going to fall into that. Look, as you can see somebody up there, there's a dirty great hole. You'd be pretty stupid to go over that one. Uh, we reached the South Pole. The Norwegians dropped out pretty much dead. We were in a very bad way, but, and the only reason we <laughs> carried on the other half from the pole was because Dr. Stroud had a contract with the Lancet magazine on the topic of advanced starvation. And at the pole, he weighed us and found that we were weighing even less than he had hoped. Or rather, we were starving even more than he had hoped. And he was determined to complete the article, even if it was posthumous, so we carried on. Um, we did the first ever descent, 9,000 foot, of the Beardmore Glacier without crampons, because we lost them. I began to hate him. Um, <laughs> I've done 25 expeditions with him since, 25 years of expeditions, but I really did hate him on that occasion. Every five days he took your blood, I didn't have much blood left by then for science. Every eight days he made you drink a container of liquid costing a thousand dollars. And for 24 hours after you drink it, any liquid coming out of your body orifices must be collected in bottles or you're in trouble, especially urine. Now, to fill a pee bottle at an average of minus 90 degrees centigrade outside uh, is dangerous for that part of your body if you are a male. Although, obviously, at that temperature, the difference between males and females is not great. Um, his hands got bad. The, the blisters fall off, leaving sort of raw skin. I don't know if you can see one of his fingers. Uh, by day 80, Seven of Mike's fingers had no skin down to the hand. Um, I had a problem. Uh, I made a three-minute mistake, as a result of which, five months later, I had the top half of all those fingers um, amputated. You need to retain your focus in those circumstances. Mike and I reached the Pacific coast pretty much dead, but we got there, at which point humans, for the first time in history, had completed the first totally unsupported crossing of the entire continent, which is bigger than China and India put together. It remains the longest unsupported polar journey in history. When we got back to Europe, we completed 19 muscle biopsies without anaesthetic to learn about um, cannibalization of muscle. Uh, that is Mike Stroud there. I enjoyed taking that picture. <laughs> we raised the sum of 4.2 million pounds from that particular expedition. So far, our expeditions have raised £16.3 million for UK charities. All the expeditions are based on a charity and a scientific programme. But from my point of view personally, that is not what it's all about. As I think I mentioned, it happens to be my profession, and I have learnt that it depends entirely on sponsorship, and that depends on staying ahead of our known rivals at all times.